Hey guys, Coach Travis Mash with you from Jim Ware back t uh, talking to you guys about beyond the basics of velocity based training. You know, we're going to look at some unconventional uses of VBT. This week we're going to look at um, tracking the bar path, video review, um, and actual bar path features on both the Jim Ware RS and the, the Jim Ware Flex units. We'll look at how, how we use the rate of force development, and we consider it to be greater than power. And we'll look at time to peak force, and then we'll show you how to use time, distance, and load to figure out all the different physics you could ever want. Uh, we'll look at uh, how we use distance to measure jumps, and we'll measure jumps in a whole lot more ways than just how high one jumps. But we'll look at the RSI, uh, and later on we'll get more into what that is, vertical leap, trap bar jumps, and more. And then we're going to look at eccentric measurements that we now have on both the Gymware RS and Gymware Flex. So we'll talk about um, how we use time and velocity and force of the eccentrics to ensure that we're getting the proper ad adaptations. Bar path and video review. We I use bar path and video review to teach my athletes, number one, technique, to teach them intent, what I'm trying to get across to them. A lot of people are very visual, me included. Um, we'll also show how we monitor and we correct by look, by using bar path and video review. And it really is really good about getting athlete buy-in. So um, we'll talk about how it's improving athlete intent and we'll actually show how we improve biomechanics, technique, um, oh, and buy-in, I said it already, with those two features. Here's an example of us using, looking at the slides. So we're, we're able to look at peak velocity along with, not only, if you notice, not only are we, are we looking at the, the concentric, but also the eccentric, which is really good, you know, when you're, when you're squatting and doing some of the other movements. So uh, there's, there's no better feature, you know, an athlete performs a snatch and it doesn't go well, and you're telling them to keep the bar close. And you know they don't even know what you're talking about, but when you can show them the side view of the snatch along with the bar path, it goes a long ways. Now, I'm gonna go and tell you, like I love velocity, everyone knows that, but the rate of force development is gonna be more important than power or velocity, you know, but you can use it to understand, you can use velocity to figure out what your rate of force development is. So yeah, force, velocity, and power, that's currently most of your focus. A lot of people, you'll hear people only focus on force, only focus on velocity, only focus on power. Once again, absolutes are probably not a great idea, but the rate to peak force is the bigger key. So remember, power equals force times velocity. Peak power can happen at almost any, um, percentage 40 60 80 sometimes even higher i know uh, dr brian mann mentioned well, a guy maxed out and actually produced his maximum amount of power and here's why you know and this is straight from uh dr mann my buddy brian but 500 watts can be expressed in three different ways you can either do it with 500 newtons of force times one meter per second of velocity one newton of force times 500 uh, meters per second of velocity or 25 newtons times 20 meters per second now that's very broad but my point is is just because your power is going up it doesn't necessarily mean that your power is going to be used on the field peak power happening slower than you know 200 to 250 milliseconds is, isn't very useful to athletes once again dr man so so with that said, if it takes you a long time, so the guy who maxed out, who produced his maximum amount of power, that, he, you know, I'm assuming, let's say if he, if he were squatting, that happened somewhere around 0.3 meters per second or slower, I guarantee, like, you know, nothing, it did not happen in 200 to 250 milliseconds. So um, that's why rate of force development is greater than power. Um, peak force, you know, is, is and really, it's easy. Rate of force development is simply peak force divided by time to peak force. Go check out my rate of force development article, and uh, it's super easy to figure out if you know time and, and you know um, if you know the time and you know 
load. You can figure out almost anything. So remember, yeah, once you have load, distance, and time for the eccentric and concentric contractions, you can calculate anything. Velocity is simply distance divided by time. So if you have, uh, whether you're using a tether on a Gemwear RS or the laser on a flex, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, those are acting as rulers and there's internal clocks. So as long as you input the load, it's easy because we know that what that uh, gravity is 0.98 meters per second uh, squared. So you know then acceleration, change in velocity is uh, divided by time. You know force, mass times acceleration. You know work equals force times distance. When you're lifting, say, 900 pounds, you're going to have to overcome acceleration of 9.81 meters per second. And all acceleration is, is you take, you know, when you get to the bottom of a squat and when you, whenever you reach your peak velocity, the time it took, that's acceleration. And so it's, it's super easy. I sometimes think we can, you know, try to make it harder than it really sounds. So with that being said, though, trying not to find out how quickly someone can produce their peak power is going to go much further as far as making them a better athlete. So, for the same reason, we use, we can measure you know, force and velocity, you know, by using distance. Like I just said, it's nothing but a ruler, you know, and it's easy for us to test jumps as well. So we can do things like reactive strength index, um, the vertical leap um, with the counter movement jump, vertical leap static. You can do pogo jumps, unilateral jumps. And the testing benefits, you're going to be able to look at elasticity, which is the change in length, volume, or shape in response to a force, followed by a recovery to original shape. What that means is this, is that when you strike the ground, like if your tendons and your joints are super strong, whatever bit of like change in shape those tendons have, you're going to get a rebound effect, much like a rubber band, but even more. So elasticity is ultra important and not talked about near enough. So we can look at force comparisons. You can look at like your jump versus your squat. So if you can produce tons of force in your squat, but when you jump, you produce very little, then that's very, that, that force you, you're capable of producing isn't functional athletically. So it's a great comparison. You can look at asymmetries when you look at right jump, left jump, uh, so bilateral, unilateral. So a lot of great information you can get with the jumps. Uh, as you can see, here's some good um, feedback with Matt Weiniger. We have ground contact time, time to peak force, uh, concentric peak power, uh, concentric peak force. And then as you see here, here's a depth jump. That's a very good depth jump. That's a 0.3 something and a 39. 0.35 yeah. um, ground contact time, 0.35 seconds with a 39 inch vertical. That's, that's pretty incredible. If you can do that, you're a great athlete. So the training is that's a match. That's you can do that, that's great too. But the training uh, benefits of distance, using jumps in your training, improves elasticity, especially the depth jumps and or repeated jumps, and pogo jumps, unilateral, uh, uh, emphasizes uh, symmetry when you use the unilateral right and left pogo jumps. So ground contact time is improved. Improving, please hear me now. If you're a coach, listen to this. Improving your ground contact time by, by only 0 .01 seconds will take someone who's running a 10.2 second 100 meter dash, it'll take it down to 9.75 seconds, which is now in metal contention. A 10.2 is a, is a really good sprinter in college. But 9.75 is a, is an Olympic medalist, so it's a big, big difference. That's assuming that he's taking the typical 45 strides in 100 meters. So that's just my way of showing you how important a very little change in ground contact time can make with athleticism. So um, you'll also create force at a higher rate. You'll get high rate um, overall power and improve acceleration, um, sprinting, especially with static jumps. So when you do a static jump. Without the counter movement jump, you just kind of start at the bottom. It's really good for acceleration, especially if you add maybe just a little weight might help. And then um, these are both good for change of directions, the depth jump, the pogo jumps, all of it. Now, last benefit I want to talk about 
um, if you if you follow us, then you know the, we just wrote a big article all about the um, awesome adaptations you get from eccentric training. So, but now both the Gymware Flex and the Gymware RS units both measure eccentrics in real time, so you can actually see it as someone's um, training. So, eccentric training. Dr. Timothy Suckamel from Carroll University, he's a leading researcher in this, um, and we're going to talk talk more about some of these types of eccentric training. The benefits you're going to get, you're going to get hypertrophy. I'm going to go quickly because if you've read, if you follow me, you, you can go back and read this in the eccentric article. But hi, um, hypertrophy, especially type two fiber enhancement, you'll get um, these. Are, these are two I just learned about: an increase in fascicle length, which um, simply means that it, when you increase your fascicles that lie within your muscle, that's where your your uh, myosin and actin are grouped. Like if those increase, that means when they contract. You, the more distance is covered, put it simple, you get faster. That means when you contract, the joint is going to rotate at a much faster, higher rate. So uh, also improving rate coding, signal from the brain to the, uh, all the motor units. So, and then your strength goes up, rate of force development goes up, uh, power, will, power will increase, especially stretch shortening cycle. The muscle tendon unit will be strengthened as a unit as a whole, which is a good thing, as I just explained, for uh, elasticity. And you'll get uh, potentiation for strength, power, and speed, and hypertrophy. These are important. There's a lot of good research with the flywheel saying it, using it for, for um, potentiation for both vertical leap and for sprinting. So just a hint. Some variables that you're, you're going to need to be aware of when you're uh, talking about eccentrics. And those are going to be the eccentric velocity or the rate. Um, those are kind of the measurement of the same thing since velocity is simply distance divided by time. So you got to know both. But um, they both, you know, with the gym wares, you can look at the rate or velocity, whichever one you want. Sometimes the rate is good because we sometimes measure eccentric strength compared to concentric by lowering a weight for four seconds, only lowering it with the goal of 120% more than your concentric, which we'll talk about in a second. But higher velocities are greater for stretch shortening cycle, fascicle length, um, and it's all on a continuum. So that means like um, when you're doing the flywheel, for example, when you're using those lighter inertial loads, it might feel like that it's you know easier to stand up, but when you get that thing going, you're moving so quickly, there'll be improvements in stretch shortening cycle and fascicle length, both leading to better sprint times and jumping higher. So but like I said, all of these things are on uh, a continuum. You know, whether you're talking about uh, using weight releasers, whether you're using uh, bands to do jumps and, and depth jumps, by the way, the same thing we just talked about, jumps are also eccentric training as well, because you got to overcome great amount, great amount of eccentric force. So some examples to think about. A submaximal eccentric load with a lightened concentric is great for power and fascicle length. So like let's say that you use 80% um, on, of your one rep max on the way down. It kicks off, say, with your weight releases, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then you come up with 60%. It's gonna, you're going to stand up much faster because of potentiation. Therefore, getting better at power since it's four times velocity. So depth jumps are great for a stretch shortening cycle and uh, the tendon matrix in general, meaning it makes your tendons tighter, which is going to make it. The thicker they get and the tighter they get, the more spring you get when your foot strikes the ground. And then a super maximum, meaning more than your 1RM on the, on the eccentric on the way down with a concentric for uh, is good for strength and muscle tendon unit. Example, 110% on the way down, 80% on the way up is great for getting stronger and a muscle tendon unit. Hypertrophy, um, using, using say like a accentuated eccentric loading is great when you're doing doubles and triples with the um, weight releasers. Because just found out too last weekend from Dr. Sukumel that 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 potentiation even of your eccentric contraction lasts for for two more reps after the first one so you're going to get improvements in eccentric strength and um, contraction rates from just that first heavy rep here we are showing you guys the, the way we use the gym to test the rsi it's so much simpler than jumping because it's automatically uploaded 
club. And so I just I get everybody in there, and they don't even know really what that means, which is perfect. So otherwise, you'll have a contest every single day of people trying to beat each other, and I'm just trying to collect data. But so measure concentric versus here are a few keys. Measure the concentric versus the eccentric strength using the four centric eccentric I told you about. Um, look at ground contact time when you're doing depth jumps. So like we use 45 centimeters, for example, it's about 18 inches. And you can either compare your team with a T-score or I've given you a good range. A ground contact time somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4 seconds is really good. You know, um, obviously the lower the better, but you also got to look at the height you're getting too. So, or less is a solid standard for speed athletes. So, um, use the gym wear RS or flex units to measure the eccentric velocity uh, time and to check out the eccentric bar path too. So use the gym wear cloud. If you want to look at eccentric force, power, work, all kinds of, of parameters. Slide, slide, slide. Go. Samsung. You got the eccentric uh, yeah. loading that Dr. Sukumel has been um, researching. So measure the eccentric time and velocity. You know, um, I say 100% plus on the eccentric load, plus 80% on standing up is great for strength. Um, eccentric only at 110% in the four second duration is great for just getting strong eccentrically. And, and it can go up. Some people I heard even as much as 150 percent of their one RM, which that'd be that's a lot. So if you're just trying to get powerful, the 80 percent eccentric, 60 percent concentric is great. Uh, hypertrophy, maybe a normal concentric load, plus 20 percent of that for the eccentric um, to get a lot on the hypertrophy. Meaning, like if you're doing, say, normally you do 80 percent for a three or four by five. You know, add 20% of that on the first rep on the way down to really emphasize the hypertrophy. On the flywheel, here's the one that's going to, pro if you have a flywheel that might rock you right here, measure the centric. We use linear velocity to measure all of our flywheel movements. We measure the centric versus the concentric, you know, because either we need to find a way to cr produce more um, stress on the way down or we need to make sure that the centric is happening at a higher rate because it, if it's faster on the way down than on the way up even with the exact same load you've got more force eccentrically so stretch shortening cycle is greater for in, uh, lighter inertial loads and then eccentric overload and hypertrophy are uh, use higher inertial loads meaning uh, if you have one of those a uh, flywheel just use your bigger wheels if you're trying to get stronger into produce eccentric um, quality overloads. If you're wanting to work on your stretch sorting cycle, use some of your uh, lighter inertial loads. More on that in the near future. Uh, accelerated centrics, that's basically where you're jumping with a band. You know, you, you want to measure the centric versus the concentric as well. And there's multiple ways to do that. With plyometrics, same thing. Uh, tempo, by doing tempo squats, just normal, you know, or sub, sub maximal loads, slower than normal i don't really see a great benefit maybe hypertrophy but yet a faster a faster eccentric is going to lead to type 2 hypertrophy which is what we're after so unless you're just a bodybuilder and i'm not even certain it matters even if you're a bodybuilder so if you're just doing five seconds on the way down with some you know uh, arbitrary number you're probably wasting your time Conclusion, remember, you're either measuring or guessing, and my athletes deserve better than me guessing. Uh, ways to use VBT other than just concentric velocity, video analysis, bar path, concentric time, distance, rate of force development, jumps, eccentric measurements. If you have any questions, email me at travis at gymware.com and read more uh, about adaptations based on the on the velocity of a repetition at gymware.com. And by the way, if you don't know, here are all the parameters we're able to uh, look at in the cloud. So it's quite a bit. So take, take your time to look through those and know that you can get a lot of information with load, distance, and time. Here are, the, here are some of my references. Feel free to comb through that. Um, I have. Uh, it'll take you a few months, but enjoy it. Thank you.